since the first century, there have been questions about the end of time and when Christ will return. In this video, we'll examine what the Bible has to say about the end of days and the second coming. Christ ascended to the Father over 2,000 years ago, and since then, questions about his return and the end of time are frequent subjects of study and conversation. Doctrines have emerged that propose a number of scenarios marking the end of time and Christ's return. One of the most popular of these is the premillennial view that describes a series of events that will occur before the Lord's return. I'll discuss that subject in detail in another video, but for now, we'll focus on what the scriptures have to say about the Lord's return. Our discussion will cover the fact that we're living in the last days. We'll answer questions about the second coming, including when it will happen, signs of the second coming, events that will occur when Christ returns, the resurrection of the dead and judgment, and the fate of the earth. Although there are conflicting ideas and doctrines about Christ's return, the facts presented in the scriptures are actually simple and very clear. Let's take a look at each of these points. In the beginning of this series, I emphasized the need to keep things in context. We can define context as the conditions or environment that words, phrases, or in the case of the Bible, entire books occur in. This environment defines what we're reading and identifies limits to our interpretation. There are several elements that make up the context. We can summarize these as the time period during which events occur or are recorded, the audience being addressed, the subject under consideration, the law in effect at the time. Establishing the context means that we'll be reminded of the ways in which God has interacted with humans and the laws he's given. We've identified three distinct dispensations in the biblical narrative. These are the patriarchal dispensation, the mosaic dispensation, and the Christian dispensation. As I discussed in a previous lesson, it's necessary that we understand the context as it affects how we can interpret and apply what we read. When we're talking about the second coming of Christ, we need to remember that things stated in the Old Testament have been fulfilled in the New Testament. For information about the end of the world, it wouldn't be appropriate to go to the Old Testament prophets for information about this since their writings don't extend beyond events that occurred in the first century. Definitive statements about the end of time, however, can be found in the New Testament. Unfortunately, there are a number of popular doctrines that draw on books such as Ezekiel and Daniel to describe events that some believe will occur and mark the imminent return of Christ. Other prophets are also utilized to prove these doctrines, such as certain statements that appear in the book of Isaiah. These doctrines take some prophetic statements out of their context and misapply them. One of the reasons why Ezekiel and Daniel are referred to is because of the similarity in language with the book of Revelation. If we were to place events spoken of by the prophet Ezekiel on a timeline, we'd see that line ending with the destruction of Jerusalem and the establishment of the church. The writing of Daniel mentions the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, which is pointed out by Christ in Matthew 24, 15, Mark 13, 14, and Luke 21, 20. Beyond these events, the Old Testament prophets say nothing that should be interpreted as pointing to the end of time. The death and resurrection of Christ and the establishment of the church on the day of Pentecost closes the door on the majority of Old Testament prophecies, with the exception in Daniel, as I noted. We'll cover this point in more detail in another video. For now, when we turn to the New Testament, we can find passages that clearly describe Christ's return and the end of time. We know that we're living in the last days based on specific characteristics in the scriptures describing the end time. The Old Testament points to three conditions that would define the last days. These are the appearance of the Messiah, the establishment of a new kingdom, and the giving of a new law. The last six lessons have discussed these points in detail, so we know that we're living in the final days of the world. So the big question many ask is, when will this take place? Since the first century, estimates and declarations of the end of the world have been too numerous to count. In our time, we have religious authors who periodically declare a time when the world will end. 
since you're watching this video, you obviously know that these predictions have been incorrect. The damaging aspect of these inaccurate predictions is that with every failed prediction, believers are viewed as gullible, ignorant, and misled. And some are. Self-proclaimed prophets, spiritualists, mystics, and others all have at one time or another set forth a date for the end of the world. World events are touted as being signs of the end, and intricately convoluted theories drawing on the Bible or other ancient documents are heralded as proof of the author's conjecture. All of these have failed. Like many other things in the Bible, the answer of when the world will come to an end is very clear and can't be any simpler if we accept what the Bible says. So what's the answer? Nobody knows. Not only does no one know, it isn't something that can be predicted. Here's what the New Testament has to say about it. In Matthew 23, Jesus denounced the Jewish religious leadership, stating, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not, in Matthew 23, 2-3. These were the people who were conspiring to kill Christ, and their rejection would culminate in God's judgment against them. As the chapter closes, Christ describes the judgment that's coming in a physical sense. In Matthew 24, the disciples were showing Christ the buildings of the temple and admiring its splendor. Christ then tells them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down in Matthew 24 and verse 2. This obviously raises questions for the disciples, so they ask Christ, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world in Matthew 24 and verse 3? This chapter will be very important in a later video, and we'll examine it in greater depth as we explore doctrines about the end of time. But for now, we'll limit our focus to the disciples' reaction to Christ's statement. The disciples pose three questions to Christ, which are, When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? and of the end of the world. Some combine these into two questions as, When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Either way will work, but I want to focus on the first question. When shall these things be? Matthew 24 presents a challenge for casual readers due to the way in which Jesus answers their questions. Christ's answers are similar to language in many Old Testament prophecies. In the scriptures, some prophecies are stated in ways that possess a dual meaning or application. One of these is a prophecy concerning David's throne and Solomon, who had become king after David died, found in 2 Samuel 7, 12-16. This particular statement has an application to the life of Solomon, but also speaks of the coming of the Messiah. Similar occurrences can be found in the writings of the prophets. In a single chapter or group of verses, multiple topics and dual prophecies may exist. Matthew 24 is an example of this. Because of that, there are many who have trouble understanding and applying what's being taught. But when it comes to the end of the world, in the midst of some very cryptic statements, Jesus answers this clearly. Note what he tells his disciples. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only, in Matthew 24, 36. Immediately before this statement, Christ had mentioned other things for which there were signs, but here he states that only God would know when the end will be. It's difficult to leave this discussion hanging, so to speak, but I'll return to that in another video with a full discussion of the chapter. What we have to keep in mind is that there were multiple questions posed, and the answers are somewhat intertwined. The questions listed a moment ago have to do with the destruction of Jerusalem, which occurred in A.D. 70, signs of the destruction of Jerusalem, and Christ's return and the end of the world. When reading Matthew 24, we need to be careful when linking Christ's statements with each of these questions. But there's a way that we know that verse 36 is dealing with the second coming. Christ talks about the sign of when that will take place. I've just shown that Christ stated that only God knows when the end will come. He then goes on to answer the second part of the question regarding a sign that will precede his return. Christ states, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. 
For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. From this passage, the short answer is, there won't be a sign. Christ brings this out in a statement that he made prior to this. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be in Matthew 24, 27. We can find similar statements that verify this. Jesus states, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come in Matthew 24, 42. He then adds, But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth in Matthew twenty four forty eight through 51. Peter also talks about the absence of a sign preceding Christ's return as he discusses the end of the world. He writes, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in 2 Peter 3.10. Paul addresses this in his letter to the Thessalonians, who had been presented with false doctrines concerning the Lord's return. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night in 1 Thessalonians 5.1-2. through 2. All of these statements by Christ himself, Peter, and Paul tell us quite plainly that there will be no sign to warn us of the coming of Christ. So if we don't know when it will happen, and there isn't going to be a sign, what will happen when the Lord returns? Some teach that Christ will return to fight against the enemies of God and will then reestablish the throne of David in Jerusalem for a period of 1,000 years. In order to reach that conclusion, a lot of scriptures are misinterpreted, misapplied, and simply misunderstood. This teaching also sets up conflicts with many other passages. So what will happen when Christ comes back? Once more, the answer is simple and stated clearly in the scriptures. One of the most direct statements about Christ's return is that made by the Apostle Paul in his second letter to the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians had been introduced to the idea that if a person died before the Lord returned, they would lose out on receiving a reward from God. Some in Thessalonica had apparently stopped working, believing that Christ's return was about to take place. In his two letters to the Thessalonians, Paul addresses these concerns and provides us with a view of what will take place when Jesus comes back. Paul states, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9. In this passage, Paul tells us the negative side of Christ's return, assuring believers that the enemies of God will be punished. But there are other passages we can turn to that provide additional detail. In his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul described the second coming as a comfort for believers. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18. In these two passages, we see the positive as well as the negative aspects of Christ's return. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul provides details. He answers their questions about the second coming. He states, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. The return of Christ is described as a sudden event involving the resurrection of the dead and adds that the trumpet of the Lord will sound at that moment as well. When we combine these descriptions with the statements of Christ, we see that the second coming will occur swiftly, have no sign to warn anyone, and will be marked by the resurrection of the dead. Along with this, another event will take place, the judgment. The most detailed account of the resurrection of the dead is found in 1 Corinthians 15. 
some of the Corinthians had questions about what would happen to the physical body and what form they would have spiritually. Paul addresses these concerns throughout the chapter. As the resurrection of the dead takes place, it will happen very quickly, or in the twinkling of an eye, according to Paul, or as the lightning flashes, as Christ stated. Note what Paul has to say about the body. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body, in 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 38. Paul continues this discussion, comparing a variety of bodies or flesh to describe the distinction between the physical and spiritual. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. 1 Corinthians 15, 39 through 45. From this, we can conclude that there will be a change. The physical body that's undergone decay or corruption, as Paul states, will be transformed by God into a spiritual body. What that will be remains to be seen as we are limited in what we can know. From these passages, we can also see that the dead will rise first, and then those who are alive will be caught up to be with the Lord. No one will be left out of this, and as these things take place, the judgment will also occur. From the passage in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, we see that Christ will return to not only reward the faithful, but also to take vengeance on those who have opposed God and rejected Christ. Paul states, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God, in Romans 14, 10 through 12. Standing before Christ in judgment, we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, in 2 Corinthians 5.10. Those who have been faithful to God and served him will reap the benefit of their service by entering the home prepared for those that love the Lord. Christ told his disciples, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also, in John 14, 2-3. Paul describes this reward in his first letter to the Corinthians. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. The promise of being reconciled to God is not only a benefit in this life, but carries into the next as we'll be able to dwell with God and Christ. The power of the gospel lies in the fact that Christ was raised from the dead and has let us know that we'll be raised as well. Doubt and concern about the resurrection of the dead and a home in heaven have filled the minds of believers and others since the first century. The Bible is a practical book and assures us of the credibility of the gospel story. Paul states, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable, in 1 Corinthians 15, 16 through 19. There are many things that may not be clear to us on this side of eternity, but what has been revealed is enough to lead us to God so we can be prepared for the coming of Christ and judgment. The writer of Hebrews sums this up very well, stating, It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment in Hebrews 9.27.
Some teach that the earth will be recreated based on statements made in the book of Revelation and other passages that speak of renewal. Once more, we have a direct answer to what will happen to the physical universe when the Lord returns. Peter provides this information in his second epistle. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. The belief that the scriptures teach that the physical world will be renewed is a misunderstanding that creates problems for passages such as this. Some of those ideas come from statements in the book of Revelation, which are highly symbolic. The New Testament is clear that when Christ returns, the world will be destroyed. To that end, we are encouraged to listen to the warnings of the scriptures and obey the Lord. Paul puts this in perspective when he spoke to the Athenian philosophers. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Acts 17, 30-31 God doesn't desire to condemn anyone, which is why he sent his Son into the world to lead us back to him. If we choose to walk away from God and reject his law, then we'll be subject to the negative aspects of judgment. On the other hand, we'll have a home with the Lord forever if we choose to accept and follow what's been commanded. Let's summarize what we know about the second coming of Christ. There will be no sign warning us of his return. No one can predict when God will send Christ back. At the moment of Christ's return, the trump of God will sound. Christ will appear in the clouds with his angels. The dead shall rise first and be joined to the Lord. The living will then be joined to the Lord. Judgment will take place, and the earth and physical universe will be destroyed. There are a few other details that the scriptures reveal, but this presentation has captured the bulk of what we need to know in order to be ready to be with the Lord. The bottom line is we should work to be prepared for that day, not out of fear, but out of love for what God has done for us. In the next video, we'll take a look at perhaps the most controversial subject that divides believers. How is one saved from their sins? What does the Bible say about salvation? And what methods can be used? Join me in the next video as we discuss the gospel plan of salvation.